Good morning, everyone. We want to welcome you out to our services here today at Hope Church Clearview. If you are joining us in person or online today, thank you so much for being here. Uh, We want you to know that if you are here for the very first time, we are a church that believes in passionately following Jesus and making him visible in our everyday lives and in everything we do. And we're all about making him visible throughout the week, not just on Sunday. And so uh, if you're new to Hope Church, we just want to let you know that that's the kind of church we are and that's who we are. We would love to connect with you if you're joining us for the first time, whether you're here in person or online. Uh, You can fill out a connect card uh, in person or digitally, and we have a free gift we would love to give you as our way of saying thank you for being with us today. And uh, we would love to connect with you and help you get plugged in uh, to all that God is beginning to do here at Hope Church. Uh, Also, we we would love to have you involved in the ministry of what's happening here. And one of the best ways we believe that you can be involved is through giving. Um, And it's because of your generosity that we're able to do ministry, that we're able to see people's lives impacted and touched by the power of the gospel. So you can, um, if you're in person today, you can uh, give here in person. If you're watching online or in person, you can give online through the Hope on the Go app and by going to our website, hopechurchclearview.com. We want to just highlight a couple of things we got coming up to let you guys know about uh, that are going to be here in just a few weeks. Uh, This upcoming Saturday... Uh, We're going to be having an ornament party for Hope Kids. Uh, So they're going to be decorating some Christmas ornaments, making some cookies, and then also I think there's going to be hot dogs for for lunch. Uh, This is going to start at 11 a.m. So we would love for your child uh, to come and be a part of that as we decorate some ornaments, make some cookies, and enjoy some hot dogs. That's going to get started at 11. And then also on December the 19th, that is a Sunday, that evening at 6 p.m., we want you to celebrate Christmas with us here at Hope Church. We're going to be having a special Christmas service that night. It's going to be a great time of some Christmas music, uh, some coffee, some hot chocolate, uh, some things like that. And we just want it to be a great time to enjoy the reason why we're celebrating the season. And, and we want you to just uh, enjoy some great music that night. So be sure to invite your friends, and we look forward to seeing you on December the 19th. Uh, for our Christmas service as we celebrate Christmas here at Hope Church. And one of the other things we want to let you guys know about is we are a church that believes strongly in the power of prayer. We believe that prayer is powerful, and we believe that that prayer changes things. And so uh, as we open our service today, we want to pray and invite the Holy Spirit in uh, as we worship together today. But we also want to highlight a few requests that uh, that were sent in this week and that were mentioned from our church family that are needs. Uh, we want to pray for, uh, for Linda's sister. She's in the hospital uh, with some diabetic-related issues. We want to uh, pray for her physical needs. Also for Miss uh, Pat Leftwich, we want to pray for her. She had messaged uh, me and said that she had fallen this week, so we want to pray for her. And then one other request I, I would like for us as a church to, um, to pray over is a a gentleman by the name of of Sam Hardy. He and I went to church together when I first came to faith in Christ as a teenager. Uh, He's probably about my age. He's in his mid-40s. They just found a mass on one side of his brain, and they found out it's it's a tumor and it's cancerous. It's an aggressive form of brain cancer. He's going to be undergoing surgery tomorrow at noon. And so I want us to pray over him. And then one final thing I want us to pray over today is Hope Church Tabor City. They are having a soft launch uh, in Tabor City, North Carolina. And this is a big deal because for the Southern Baptists of North Carolina, this is their first church launch since COVID. And so this is a huge thing for the state of North Carolina and for our Hope Church family. So I would like to invite you to stand today as we prepare to worship. And let's pray and invite God into our service today. Uh, and over these requests. Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for the fact you are a God that desires for us to come before you and to to bring our, our cares and our worries and our doubts and our fears. And God, we pray over the request mentioned for, for Linda's sister, for uh, Miss Pat. We, we pray for, for them physically that you would touch them and help them and, and bring healing to them. And we pray over Sam Hardy, God, as he's preparing for uh, surgery tomorrow at 12. And we pray for his family. God, we just pray that you would guide the doctors and that you, God, would, would bring healing to his body. And that, God, you would eradicate the cancer that they have found. 
God, we pray over Hope Church Tabor City today as they have a soft launch. And, and God, we are so thankful for how you are at work within our Hope Church family of churches. And God, all that is happening, we, we just pray today for them that you would meet with them. And God, that you would do great things among them. And as we worship together today here at Hope Clearview, God, I pray that you would do amazing things in our hearts and our lives. God, that we would leave this place in a different way than we came in, God, that you would work uh, just to make us more like Jesus. And that when we leave this place today, Father, our lives would reflect a little bit more of Jesus in our lives. God, may our worship today be pleasing to you through the singing, the giving, the preaching of your word. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all worship together.
hard to see it. It took me so long to believe it. That you choose someone like me to carry your victory. Perfection could never earn it. You give what we don't deserve, and you take the broken raise them to glory and you are my champion and giants fall when you stand undefeated every battle you won i am who you say i am you crown me with confidence i am seated in the heavenly place undefeated with the one who has conquered it all and now I can finally see it you're teaching me how to receive it so let all the striving cease and this is my victory and you are my Giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every battle you won, I am who you say I am. Crown me with confidence, I am seated in the heavenly place undefeated with the one who has conquered it all.
living come down Spirit break out Break our whole sound Spirit break out Christmas is familiar to all of us. The sights, sounds, smells, the beloved traditions, they have all shaped our perspective on this most loved holiday. This is the time of year when people spend more time with family, take more time to decorate, feel more nostalgic, act more sentimental. This is the time of year when people think more about the needs of others and actually give more to help meet those needs. But shouldn't our perspective shouldn't on the celebration, perspective of celebration of Jesus' birth be shaped more by God's word more by God's and, less word by the culture? and less by the culture? Shouldn't we take the time we take to look the at time Christmas through the eyes through of the those eyes who appear on the pages those of the Bible, on the pages of the those who are actually a part, of the, story. part of the story? I think that would change I think that our would lives change our forever. Lives. Before we jump into the message, I just want to say like, uh, how blessed we are with great music and people that lead us in worship. And I just want to, let's just, let's just give some praise that the worship this morning was, was just amazing and it just ties right into what we're going to be talking about today. And, and I just pray that as we get started that we will just allow the Holy Spirit to come into this place and into our hearts and to break down any walls that we came in here with and that we'll allow him to just do in our hearts and our lives what he wants to accomplish. And that we'll just be open to that because we just need to get out of the way and let God work in our midst and, and let the Spirit have his way in our hearts and our lives. And I pray that we'll just allow barriers to be broken down in our hearts this morning. Today we're going to be in Luke chapter number 2. Luke chapter number 2. And we're going to be talking about this week the shepherd's perspective. We're in the middle of this series right now called Christmas in Perspective, and it is literally taking the, the people of the Bible and looking at Christmas from their point of view and their perspective. And last week, we kicked off the series looking at God's perspective from the perspective of our Heavenly Father, and this week we are looking at the shepherd's perspective. And as we talked about last week, we all have different points of view all have different perspectives on how we see the world, and there are a lot of things that influence that. Uh, where we come from, if you grew up in an urban area or if you grew up in a very rural area, those are things that would affect your perspective on things. If you grew up in the United States versus growing up in another country, that would affect your perspective. Not only that, but uh, the way we were raised, what values were instilled in us, the people we associate with, who our friends are, um, the people that we're around, they influence our perspective on things. And as we talked about, it's healthy and it's good for us to consider other perspectives other than our own. That's how we grow. And one of the dangers that we have is ignoring the perspective of someone else because it's different than ours. If we do that, we're never going to grow. We're never going to move beyond where we are, and God's going to not be able to work in our hearts and our lives in the same way that he could if we were open to different perspectives. And so that's exactly what we're going to be doing here today, uh, and we're going to be looking at the perspective of the shepherds. As we think about Scripture, our culture tends to have this idea, and we kind of lean towards this, about how we, and even not just Scripture, but things in general, we romanticize things. People do this all the time, brother. Maybe it's with a, a wedding or something like that. We have in our minds when we, we're getting married that how things are going to be. We, we have this kind of picture, I guess, of this fairy tale of, of how things are going to go when we're married. And uh, sometimes it doesn't go that way. Uh, we get smacked in the face with reality in real life, and, and stuff we see on TV is not reality. But we tend to romanticize things, whether it's maybe it's our wedding, maybe it's even nostalgia. 
we romanticize it. People talk about, you know, they say, well, back in the good old days, but, you know, the good old days, there wasn't air conditioning, there wasn't indoor plumbing, there wasn't electricity, you know, maybe for some places, and I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound very good to me. Uh, I enjoy my indoor plumbing, I enjoy my electricity, and, and I enjoy the comfort of, of heat and air uh, so we can stay comfortable year-round. But we tend to romanticize things, and, and we can do that in Scripture as well. And I think a lot of times when we think about the Christmas story, we tend to romanticize the idea of the birth of Jesus and and all the events that surrounded it, whether it be from the manger to the shepherds in the field to later on when the, the magi or the wise men come to the house where Jesus is with Mary and Joseph. But the shepherds, uh, when we we think about them, there's really not much to romanticize. If you do any studying on shepherds and you look into their background, uh, they were in general, in biblical times, considered dishonest and unclean according to the standards of the law. In fact, being a shepherd was not something that was looked upon favorably. And if you'll remember in the Old Testament that the nation of Egypt, they despised shepherds. They looked at them as an abomination. Shepherds were not somebody that were high up on the, the ladder of, of the world. They were not somebody that was looked upon favorably. And so we want to look at Christmas today from their perspective. So in Luke chapter 2, we're going to begin reading in verse number 8, and we're going to read down through verse number 20 today. Beginning in verse 8, the Bible says, That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep, Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened and which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened, and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard. It was just as the angel had told them. And so as we talked about just a minute ago, that shepherds were considered Uh, not desirable in that culture. In fact, they were despised by the quote-unquote good and respectable people of the day. According to the Mishnah, uh, shepherds were regarded as thieves, and the only people lower than shepherds at that particular time in Jewish history were lepers. And if you think about that, that tells us where they were on the the ladder of of social acceptance. Uh, Lepers basically were the bottom of the barrel. So if you had leprosy, you had to live in a colony by yourself with other lepers. You were not, you know, allowed to have contact with other people outside of that leper colony. In fact, when you went into public, if you walked out onto a street, you had to shout, unclean, unclean, to let everyone know that you were there and that you were a leper. Can you imagine that basically one step up from that would have been shepherds? They were regarded, uh, as we said, as thieves, and and only people that were lepers were considered lower than them. Warren Wearsby, he said in his commentary on this passage, he says, In that day, shepherds were considered to be at the lowest rung of the social ladder. Their work not only kept them away from the temple and the synagogue, but it made them ceremonially unclean. But yet, in his grace, God gave the first announcement of the Savior's birth, to lowly shepherds. And so the fact that the message came to shepherds first and not to the high and mighty reminds you and I that God comes to the needy. God comes to those who are poor in spirit. We talked about that back in our last series, Kingdom Living, that uh, it says that blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs shall be the kingdom of heaven, that God comes to those who are needy. 
and poor in spirit. See, the shepherds, they represent the outcasts and the sinners from who, whom, Jesus, whom Jesus came. They were to be the first recipients of this good news. I love what author Philip Yancey, he says about this. He says, yet as I read the birth stories about Jesus, he says, I cannot help but conclude that though the world may be tilted toward the rich and powerful, God is tilted toward the underdog. And, and that's exactly what we find when we see the story of the shepherds. And we think about Christmas from their perspective is that God is not so much uh, tilted towards those that are high and mighty or the rich and the powerful, but God is tilted towards those who are broken, those who are in darkness, those who or in sin, those who are needy, those who are poor in spirit, those are the ones that God is tilted towards. James chapter 2 verse 5 says, listen to me, dear brothers and sisters, hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? See, Jesus is saying, and James is repeating, that God has chosen those that are poor in this world to be rich in faith. And he's saying those are the ones that are going to inherit the kingdom that he's promised. And, and that was one of the things that when Jesus came, those that were religious, those that were high and mighty, those that were of the upper echelon of society, they didn't think they needed Jesus. They, they were like, nope, that's not for us. Have you ever noticed a lot of times you talk to people and they go, well, yeah, you know, that, that's for somebody else who needs it. I, I'm good. And, and when someone says that, they don't realize that you might be high and mighty, and you might be in the upper echelon of society, but your need for Jesus is just as great as the drug addict or the drunk or anybody else. We all have a need for Jesus because we all are sinful and we all are separated from God um, before coming to Christ. And so James is, is echoing Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount and saying that it's those types of people. Those are the ones that God is coming for. Those are the ones that God is going to deliver this message of hope to first. Those are the ones that are going to be the very first ones to know about the birth of this Savior. And so, as we think about the text we just read, there, early on there's, there's a thing that it says that when the angel of the Lord appeared to the shepherds, it says that the glory of the Lord, or the Lord's glory, surrounded them. And so as we think about that, this is interesting because this is probably likely the very first time in a very long time that God's glory had been revealed to anyone in that way. Uh, the glory of the Lord is God's visible presence in creation, but it's also associated with several important events in Israel's past. The glory of the Lord was associated with the giving of manna. Uh, when God fed the Israelites in the wilderness and he provided food for them. It's associated with the covenant at Mount Sinai when the Ten Commandments was given and, and we see the, the cloud that descends on the mount and, and, and Moses, when he comes back down from the mountain, is, is, is shining. There's something different about his uh, countenance. It's also uh, uh, associated with the rising of the tabernacle. Uh, which was where God met with the Israelites in the wilderness. They constructed a tabernacle where they would meet with the Lord and they would sacrifice and they would worship him. And so it's associated with that. Also, it's associated with the construction of the temple. Uh, when they built the temple in Jerusalem, that was where God's presence dwelt in the Old Testament, was literally in the four walls of that temple. And, and so the glory of the Lord is associated with all these events. Also in Exodus chapter 33, verses 18 through 20, we see Moses asking God, he says, show me your glory. And what does God tell him? He says that, and I'm paraphrasing, he says that I can't do that because no man can see me and live. Basically, Moses, if you were to really catch a glimpse of my glory, it would kill you because nobody can stand to see my glory. But he says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pass by and I'm going to hide you in this rock. And, and when I pass by, I'm going to uncover so you can see my hind parts. Basically, the, the backside is I pass on. And he got just a glimpse of God's glory. And it says that when he saw that, he had to put a veil over his face because it was so bright and the children of Israel could not look on him. And so we see that the glory of the Lord, it... it that it manifested itself in, in different ways. But in Ezekiel chapter 10, we also see one of the saddest stories in all of Scripture. 
And that is when the glory of the Lord departs from the temple in Jerusalem. They are about ready to be led into captivity. The Babylonians are coming and they're getting ready to be conquered. And we see as we read through chapter 10 that the, the Shekinah glory of God, the, the glory of the Lord hovers in the temple and then it begins to rest on the cherubims and then we see it hover above the temple and then before long it has already departed out of the temple and the glory of the Lord is gone. And yet we read in this passage that the radiance of God's glory has shone on the shepherds in this moment to announce the birth of the Savior, the birth of the Messiah. And so I want to take what time we have here today and I want to give you three things about Christmas from the shepherd's perspective as we think about the passage that we just read. Number one, <clears throat> notice that <clears throat> excuse me, notice that we see God met the shepherds where they were. God met them where they were. The shepherds were watching their sheep through night, but while the sheep they were watching the sheep, guess what? God was watching the shepherds. God knew exactly where they were. He knew everything that was going on. God knew exactly where they were in their cultural insignificance, in their social stigma. He knew where they were in their lack of education, their lack of refinement. None of those things prevented or discouraged God from giving them a visual display of his glory. He knew exactly where they were. He knew exactly who they were. <clears throat> None of that kept God or discouraged him from displaying his glory to the shepherds. See, society may have considered them castoffs, but we find that shepherds have a special place in God's redemptive story. They have a special place, I, I believe, in the pages of Scripture as we see God's heart. Think about Moses. <clears throat> Moses was raised in all the luxuries of Egypt. Moses grew up with all the finer things of life, but yet as he gets older, he chooses to leave all that and identify with his people, the Hebrews. And as after he kills one of the Egyptians, he flees into the wilderness, into the desert. And what does Moses do? He becomes a shepherd. And for the next 40 years, Moses is shepherding flocks in the backside of the desert. And God is using that time as a shepherd to prepare him for what he's going to do later to deliver the children of Israel. What about David? <clears throat> When Samuel is, is trying to choose the replacement for Saul, he goes to all of Jesse's sons and, and he keeps going one by one and he gets to uh, David who was a, a shepherd boy. He was kind of a runt. He was a little guy and, and David was a shepherd and it says he was a man after God's own heart. And there's other examples of, of shepherds throughout scripture, but we see that God considered them to be special in his redemptive story. Society may have cast them off, but God saw their importance. And so I just want to say today that if you feel like you're not important, and if you feel like your life doesn't matter, maybe society and culture tells you, yeah, you're not important, but God says that's not true because you are created in my image and you bear my image and you reflect my glory and so you are important and you have worth because of, we, we, <clears throat> because of being created in his image. See, Satan and even religion, they try to... Uh, we see that they try to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, try to make us think that you and I have to, to get our lives together before we can come to Jesus. But it's actually just the opposite. We find that <clears throat> many people in, in, uh, that were prominent in biblical history were called by God from the realm of the culturally insignificant to be his servants. And so if you're here today and, and, and maybe you are struggling. Maybe you're struggling with depression. You're struggling with addiction or brokenness or hopelessness or apathy or, or anything else that you can think about. God is ready to meet you today where you are in your mess, in your brokenness, in your hopelessness. God is ready to meet you because you don't get your life together and then come to Jesus. No, you come to Jesus as you are. He meets you where you are, and Jesus radically transforms your heart and your life and changes everything about you. And, and so God met them where they were. And I'm thankful today that God meets us where we are, that we don't have to get things straightened out. We don't have to get cleaned up. We don't have to get every little bit of our lives in order before we can approach Jesus, because Jesus 
is approaching us. He meets us where we are. And that's one of the things that the enemy wants us to believe about ourselves is that we, we have to do all these things. And, and the enemy speaks to us and says, well, you can't follow Jesus because, well, you are this. Or you can't follow Jesus because you've got this in your life. And that's the enemy talking. Jesus is saying to us, follow me. Because if we follow Jesus, he will radically change all of these things. We see that not only did God meet them where they were, but secondly, we see that they had a life-changing encounter. They had a life-changing encounter. Number one, we see they, they hear a message from the angel of the Lord that says, he says, behold, I bring you good tidings uh, uh, and, and he says that's going to be for all people. He says that today in the city of David is born a Savior, Christ the Lord. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we see there is good news announced about the birth of the Messiah. They hear a message from God, the angel of the Lord about what God is doing. This news would bring great joy, it says, to all people. And so they hear this message of hope. They hear a message uh, of, of something that gives them <clears throat> something to look forward to, something to believe in. And if you think about this time in Jewish history, there was a lot of hopelessness because it had been over 400 years since they had had God speak to them in any relevant way. 400 years <clears throat> since God had really manifested himself to them in any, any, any way. And yet he chooses this moment in history to shine his light into darkness and to announce the birth of his son, Jesus, the Savior, the Messiah, to a bunch of lowly shepherds. But this news would bring great joy to all people, not just for Israel, but eventually it would also bring great news for us, the Gentiles. So the birth of Jesus was primarily first and foremost to the nation of Israel because that was their promised Messiah that God had promised them years and years before. But not only was he be the Savior and the Messiah for Israel, but he also would be the Savior of the entire world for us as well, that God, in his plan of redemption, made Jesus a sacrifice not just for the sins of, of Israel, but for the sins of the entire world. And so they heard the message from the angel of the Lord. Think back to, to if you're a follower of Jesus, the first time when you heard the message of the gospel, the message of hope that even though we are separated from God, that we are far from God because of our sin, because of, of, of the rebellion that is in our hearts that we inherited from Adam and Eve, but in spite all of those things, that the good news is God sent his son, born of a virgin, under the law, at the right time to redeem us, to fulfill the law that we could not keep, to take our place on the cross. Think when you heard that message. And maybe you're here today or watching online and you've never, that's foreign to you, you've never heard that message before, that we are separated by, by our sin from God and that because of that, we deserve eternal punishment. But God is rich in love and mercy. And because of God's great love for us that he, he did send Jesus Maybe that's the first time you're hearing about that, but if it is, we see that this is a message that is good news, because without the birth, the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus, we would be hopeless. We would be lost in our sins today. But not only did they hear a message from the angel of the Lord, we see, secondly, they experienced the reality of the message. They experienced the reality of the message. The shepherds had a personal encounter with Jesus himself. In fact, when they hear the message from the angel of the Lord, and after the, the heavenly choir of angels appears and they hear all uh, of this worship, and the angels leave, the shepherds decide, we're going to go to Bethlehem and we're going to see this thing for ourselves. And so they arrive and they see the baby in a manger. And they see Mary and Joseph, <clears throat> and they see all the, the animals that are around them. And they have a personal encounter with Jesus himself. See, it's one thing for you and I to hear about Jesus, but it is a completely different thing for us to experience the reality of who Jesus is. And what I'm afraid happens in, in, in church world, especially in America, we hear a lot about who Jesus is, and we hear a lot about Jesus, but I'm afraid there are a lot of us that don't know 
Jesus, that we have never truly experienced him. And, and what I mean by that is, so for instance, I love, um, I love the Pittsburgh Steelers. They're, they're my favorite football team in the NFL. But uh, particularly, I love the Pittsburgh Steelers from the 1970s. Uh, Terry Bradshaw is like my favorite quarterback of all time, and, and uh, anybody who's probably younger than me has no clue who I'm talking about. Um, but Terry Bradshaw, Franco Harris, Lynn Swan, John Stallworth, I, uh, you know, I can name a bunch of names, and I can tell you all these things about them. Um, I love professional wrestling. You know, I, that's one of my, I love watching that. I can tell you all these things about my favorite wrestlers that I love watching, you know, provide entertainment. But the thing is, I know about them. But I don't know them personally. If I were to, to walk up to them, I don't know anything about their lives as far as who they really are as a person. I don't know them. And it's a completely different thing to just hear about Jesus than it is to know who he is and experience the reality of who he is. I'm afraid many people in church world in America, what happens for so many people is we hear about Jesus, we pray a prayer because we don't want to go to hell, and we think we're okay and that's not what Jesus calls us to. That's not what following Jesus is. Following Jesus means that, that we surrender ourselves and we lay ourselves out in front of Jesus and say, I am yours. And we lay our lives down and we surrender our lives to him and we repent of our sin and we turn from the direction we were going and we go in a new direction. And it's all about following him for the rest of our lives and making our lives look like him. And it's not we come to Jesus because we don't want to go to hell. We come to Jesus because of who he is and what he has done for us. I don't know about you, but I have a hard time not placing my faith and trust in Jesus when I hear about what he did for me. And when I think about <clears throat> who I am and I think about the reality of how broken I am and how messed up I am. And, and despite all of that, despite the fact that I could care, have cared less about God in my life for 15 years that I lived, I lived selfishly for me, but in spite of all of that, Jesus came and gave his life for me. How can I not respond favorably to someone who would do that for me? How can we not respond favorably for the one who would say to the Father, to the very ones who are nailing him to the cross and cursing him and mocking him and spitting on him, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. How can we not give our lives to someone who would demonstrate a love like that? But we see that they experience the reality of this message. And it's totally a different thing to just hear and to experience. But let me give you the third thing. Number three, we see that not only did, uh, they, were they met, did God meet them where they were, not only did they have a life-changing encounter, but then number three, we see they celebrated and made known that life-changing encounter. They celebrated and made known that life-changing encounter. Guess what? They told others about all they had seen and experienced. Our text tells us, it says that they went away from Bethlehem and they told everyone what they had seen and heard, everything that they had experienced. And in fact, it says that the others, when they heard, they were astonished at all the shepherds had told them. Meaning that it was, it was just unbelievable. It was like one of those, when you're astonished at something, like, it's like, wow, I, that's just mind-blowing. I can't believe that that's reality. But they told others about all they had seen and experienced. But then also there's something else that we see. Um, they went back to their flocks. At the end of our text, it, it says that the shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. And I think this is an important point for us to understand from their perspective. See, often in our Christian culture today, we do the exact opposite. And what I mean by that is what we do in our Christian culture today is we do the exact opposite. When a person has a life-changing encounter with Jesus, when Jesus radically alters and changes their lives, what we are so quick to do in the American church is, uh, especially in years gone by, we were so quick to tell them, okay, that's great. You're a follower of Jesus now, so you need to you need to hang out with all you need to hang out with Christians all the time. That that those people you were friends with before, you, you need to be careful hanging around them because they may corrupt you. And well, you need to distance yourself from them because what they're doing is is not right and it it doesn't align with Scripture. And, and so you shouldn't really have anything to do with those people. 
We encourage them to keep their distance from unbelievers. <clears throat> That's what we've done throughout the years in American Christianity. But we find that this is completely the opposite of what we find in Scripture. That is not what Scripture teaches. In fact, we find in Scripture that every time someone has a life-altering, life-changing encounter with Jesus, they go back to their friends and their family. They go back to their life that they were living, and guess what they do? They tell others about their encounter with Jesus. They invite others to meet Jesus. They invite others to experience Jesus. Think about Matthew, the tax collector, or was known as Levi. What happens as soon as Jesus tells him, he says, follow me. And then he leaves the tax collection booth and follows Jesus. And when he does that, what does he do? It says, then he has a, a feast at his house and he invites all his tax collector friends. And he invites Jesus. And then guess what happens? The Pharisees, they see what's going on and they start murmuring and complaining. Oh, he is a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And they start uh, using that as an insult to Jesus. Oh, he's associating with them. In fact, we see that uh, not only does another tax collector, Zacchaeus, he, he, tells, uh, he gets up in a tree to, to see Jesus, and, and Jesus tells him, Zacchaeus, I'm, I'm coming to your house today. So he has Jesus in his house, and then Jesus is in the house of, of someone else, and um, Simon the Pharisee, and there's a woman there that's anointing his feet and, and, and literally using her hair and washing his feet with her tears and using her hair to wash his feet. And, and that Pharisee goes in himself, says, well, if this man were truly a prophet, he would know what kind of woman she is. And, and it's kind of like he's saying, you know, Jesus, if you really were the son of God, you, you, you wouldn't have anything to do with those types of people. And we find that, that that's exactly the opposite of what Scripture teaches. Scripture teaches that when someone came to faith in Jesus, Guess what they did? They went back home to their friends and their family. They, they didn't avoid them. They were like, hey, you got to come meet this guy that I, that I met. you got to meet this man who told me everything, the Samaritan woman at the well. Meet the man who told me everything that I had done, all that I had done. He is the Messiah. And so we find that that's completely the opposite of what we find in Scripture. And so I want you to know today that as we think about they celebrated and made known this life-changing encounter, God has sovereignly placed you where you live. God has sovereignly placed you in the family that you are in. He has sovereignly placed you where you work. He sovereignly placed you with the acquaintances you have. And he has done that intentionally for you to make him known and to be a light for him. See, here's the thing. <clears throat> As Christians, we, we shouldn't keep our distance from unbelievers. We should be investing our lives into forming relationships with unbelievers and building friendships with unbelievers and, and showing people who Jesus is. That's what Scripture calls us to do. And, and the more we don't do that, the more we isolate ourselves with just other believers within the four walls of the building, the more irrelevant we become to the culture around us and the more we have trouble reaching the culture around us because guess what? We don't know anybody that's not like us. And that goes back to the perspectives. That's why it's important for us to have relationships and friendships with people who have different perspectives from us. But when we think about where God has sovereignly placed us to make him known and to be a light for him, I just want to kind of share a little bit for a moment. This is going to be vitally important for us as a church moving into 2022. That we believe that we are to celebrate and make known the life-changing encounter we've had with Jesus. And, and Scripture tells us that we're all to do that. And this is going to be vitally important for us, understanding that where we live, where we work, where we play, the people we know, God has, in his divine sovereignty, placed us in those places and in those situations. And so what we're going to be asking everyone in this coming year is we're going to ask you to be a light for your community. We're going to ask you to be a light, to, to celebrate what Jesus has done in your heart and your life and to make known what Jesus has done in your heart and your life. And that looks like this. <clears throat> it looks like we're going to identify who our neighbors are. We're going to get, find out who the people are that live around us. We're going to get to know who they are by name. And after we do that, then we're going to begin daily to intentionally pray for them. We're going to begin to intentionally, daily pray for our neighbors by name and pray for God to shine his light into their hearts and their lives. 
and for God to step into the darkness <clears throat> and God to show them their need for Christ. But then we're going to keep going. We're going to identify who they are. We're going to pray for them. But then we're going to seek opportunities to care for them and to invest in them. We're going to seek for opportunities to care for our neighbors. And, and caring for our neighbors can look like a lot of different things. Caring for them can be praying for them. It can be, <clears throat> if we know something's going on in their lives, being there for them. Caring for them could be taking them some cookies, maybe making them a pie or a cake, especially at the holidays. Uh, it, it could maybe look like if we know there's a need they have, meeting that need. Uh, whatever that may be, and we're going to begin to care for them. And we're going to begin to invest in their lives. Meaning, and what that means is invest in is we're going to have a stake in their lives. <clears throat> Excuse me, we're going to invest to the point that we have an involvement and an interest in what happens in their world. And that involves us talking to them. It involves us asking questions and listening. And lis let them tell us what's happening in their lives. Because I will guarantee you and bet you there are many people that you know in your that are your neighbors that are in your front row, whether they be actual neighbors or friends or family or acquaintances, that are going through something right now and they just need somebody to listen to them. So we're going to seek for opportunities to care and invest. But then we're also going to seek for opportunities to share the gospel and then disciple them. And we're going to be sharing more about this in the coming weeks, but... The SBC of Virginia has a great tool to help us accomplish all of that, uh, and, and it's called Bless Every Home. And it's going to help us identify who our neighbors are. It's going to help us begin to pray for them. And then it's going to give us the opportunity to, to care for them and to invest in them and then share the gospel and disciple them. So I want to wrap all this up today <clears throat> as we think about the shepherds and Christmas from their perspective. See, God was making a statement when shepherds were the first to receive the good news that a Savior had been born. God was making a statement to them, and he's making a statement to you and I right now in 21st century America. <clears throat> and so here's what he's trying to say. We see that on the night that Jesus was born, the glory of the Lord does not appear in the temple nearby in Jerusalem, nor does the glory of the Lord shine around the manger of the newborn Savior, Jesus. But instead, we see the glory of the Lord appearing in an open field to lowly shepherds faithfully keeping watch over their sheep. So listen, <clears throat> I want you to get this. Heaven's glory came to earth and filled the night sky with a light for a group of shepherds who were sitting in darkness. Think about that. The glory of the Lord, heaven's glory, came to earth and filled that night sky with a light to a group of lowly shepherds that was sitting in darkness. Think about it. If you've ever been in a field out in the middle of nowhere, it is dark. And back then, they didn't have flashlights. They didn't have, you know, all the, the things to illuminate like we do today. And you know when you're in a dark place you go into a room and the lights are turned off, especially like if you've been in a room with light and then you go into a room where there's no light, it takes your eyes a while to adjust. And when you first walk in, you're, you're kind of feeling things around. You don't want to walk into something and, and you just can't see. But these shepherds were sitting in darkness and heaven's glory comes to earth that night to be a light for a group of shepherds who are sitting in darkness. And so here is what God is trying to communicate. And this is the statement that God is making. And it's this. And this is Christmas from the shepherd's perspective. The good news of the gospel is always for those who are dirty, living in the dark, in need of a Savior. The good news of the gospel is always for those who are dirty, living in the dark, in need of a Savior. So today, whether you're here in person or online, I don't know where you're at in life. But know this, the good news is Jesus came to this earth for people just like you and people just like me. It doesn't matter if you're the drug addict, you're the drunk. It doesn't matter if you're the CEO. It doesn't matter if you're the president. It doesn't matter if you fall somewhere in between on that spectrum and you're just an average Joe living a life of obscurity. Jesus came to this world for people who are broken for people who are hurting, 
for people whose lives are jacked up in a mess, those are the people that Jesus came. Because guess what? That's all of us. We all have junk in our lives that is a mess. We all have brokenness in our lives. We all have areas of hopelessness in our lives. And we all have areas of apathy in our lives. And Jesus was born into the world for people just like us living in the dark in need of a savior. And so today, whether you are a follower of Jesus or maybe you've never become a follower, you're not a follower of Jesus and you've never had a personal relationship with him, I just want you to know today that Jesus came to this world for you. If we're followers of Jesus, he came for us. And, and we look back and we celebrate and we rejoice in the fact that he did come for us. If you're here today or watching online and you're not a follower of Christ, the good news is it doesn't matter what you've done in your past. It doesn't matter even what is in your present because Jesus came for you. And he doesn't see your past. He doesn't see the present, but he sees who you can be in him. And we have to understand that Jesus sees our potential that we don't even see in ourselves because he created us. And that is good news today because we live in a world that is full of bad and depressing news. We see things all around us that are discouraging. But the encouraging news of, of the Christmas story is that there is hope. There is light. There is joy. There is fulfillment. There's contentment. There's all these things to be found in the person of Jesus. And he's saying today that, like he said in his word, all you who are, who, are, who are burdened and heavy laden, he says, come to me and find rest. Take my yoke upon you because it is light. It's easy and my burden is light. Jesus is saying that you're weary with life, come to me and I'll give you rest. And that's the good news of the gospel is that Jesus came into this world for people just like you and people just like me. Let's all stand as we pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for the good news that the gospel is for people that are messed up, broken, jacked up, people that are far from you, people whose, li whose lives are messy. God, thank you for the fact that Jesus meets us in all of those things. God, thank you for the fact that Jesus not only meets us there, but he doesn't leave us there. He meets us in our mess. He redeems our brokenness and he redeems all of those things. And for our sin, he gives us his righteousness. And then he takes us on a journey of being more like him and, and moving us to a place of where he wants us to be. God, I pray today that if there be someone here in this place or there be someone online hearing this message today, God, and they're not a follower of Jesus, God, I pray that you would show them their need for Christ today, that you would open their hearts and their eyes and their minds to the reality that even though they've messed up, even though that they've got sin in their life, and even though they've, they've, they're in a mess, God, open their eyes and their hearts and their minds to the truth that you will redeem all those things. And the Bible says that if we, return, we turn from our sins and we repent, we place our faith and our trust and, and say, Jesus, I believe that you died for my sins and I believe that your sacrifice was sufficient to pay for my sins. And, and God, I'm trusting in that payment and that substitutionary atonement. That if we'll do those things with our heart and believe in our hearts, that you will save us from our sins, that you will redeem us and give us eternal life. So God, I pray if there's one here today that's never done that, God, I pray they'll see their need. And if there's someone here in person or someone online, God, that at one time they, they said they were a follower of yours, but now their life doesn't look so much like it and doesn't reflect it, God, I pray that you would draw them back to yourself, that, God, you would help them to see that even though they may have messed up, that there is new grace, that there is new mercies, that there is new forgiveness available for them all they have to do is come to you. So God, I pray today, wherever we are, God, that we'll respond to the good news 
And that good news is that Jesus came into this world to redeem us, to save us, to deliver us. And God, that we'll respond in repentance and faith today. And we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all worship together. And I pray today that you'll respond as God has spoken to your heart. Let's worship together.